All right, so uh, hello everyone. As uh, Shelley said, my name is Jeff Myers. I work with Arizona Game and Fish, expert on everything streaming, maybe a strong word, but I will do the best I can. It is uh, an excellent, excellent tool and it's just really cool. So uh, without further ado, let's dive in. We'll talk about our streaming wildlife cams and kind of what goes into that, what you should consider uh, and how to go about doing uh, the process of doing uh, streaming wildlife cams with uh, the group that you work with. So in Arizona, we currently have six different wildlife uh, cameras. Uh, okay, we have a bald eagle cam, which is right uh, near our headquarters here. We have a sandhill crane cam, which is easily our most reliable viewer uh, for uh, people. And we have the uh, a bat cam, which is coming into season now, a desert pupfish cam, which is excellent if you suffer from insomnia. Um, we had a peregrine falcon cam uh, that is no longer active. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment um, when we get to peregrine cams. And <clears throat> we have a great horned owl cam. Uh, all of these are currently streaming with the exception of the peregrine cam on our website and there's uh, other ways to do that that we'll talk about. So the first thing that people ask is, you know, why should we do this investment? Because it is a significant financial investment. Why should we do that uh, with CAMS? Well, you know, one, it fills a need to educate the public about wildlife, wildlife conservation um, in your state. Most people, you know, I work for a state wildlife agency, obviously, and most folks have no idea what we do outside of hunting and fishing. They have no idea about the boots on the ground wildlife conservation work. We in Arizona work to protect 800 species and, you know, about 63, 64 are game and fish species that are uh, available for take. So it's interesting that, you know, the majority are actually non-game species, but people just don't know. They don't think about game and fish uh, or fish and game or DWR or any of these um, when uh, they think about wildlife conservation. So it helps change that perception. It gets the public excited about that work that your department or agency is doing. It engages is the ever elusive uh, non-consumptive or non-traditional constituents um, because this is something that they're particularly interested in and seek out. Uh, it delivers a focused messaging or allows you the ability to deliver focused messaging. Um, and during peak activity for us, some of our wildlife cams have drawn near a million individual viewers then in the, the jargon is unique client IP. So that means that an individual coming from their internet protocol uh, address. So we know that's an individual, not um, you know, the same person coming back again and again. And the actual number was about 942,000 viewers per month. That was on our Peregrine cam uh, and people went crazy for it. But that means that this form of digital engagement with our particular, you know, with the wildlife viewing program is the most wide ranging form of engagement that is undertaken by the Arizona Game and Fish Department, not even close compared to anything else. So one of the things that we do is we always kind of try to make um, uh, good ways to promote these. So in social media, I'll play this quick video. This was the promotion for when we installed the uh, a few years ago. Get ready for the ride of your life. From the folks at Arizona Game and Fish who brought you the crane cam, Peregrine Cam and Bat Cam comes a cinematic experience you won't want to miss. So the nest is right here. A guaranteed cliffhanger fueled by the sun. In a world of wildlife cameras, there's only one Lake Pleasant Bald Eagle Cam. Streaming the best of the nest in exceptional clarity day and night. We'll be able to see courtship, nest building, egg laying, hatching, uh, young feeding, growing, and then ultimately fledging. The eagles have landed. I'm really excited. Watch them while you can. So 
So in, in this, you get this, my uh, predecessor, uh, Randy Babb, with his Yosemite Sam hat, which is, is pretty awesome. But I can't emphasize enough the need for promotion for your cameras to get viewership, uh, to get that going, to boost numbers. We see a direct correlation when we do social media posts, when we make little videos like that that get picked up by local news. And they put that out those stories, and that really drives a lot of viewership on the cameras. And we'll talk about why that's potentially important as well. But just showing a, a, a standard flow chart, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but just to show you the way that it works, you know, there's viewers that are watching our cams on our site, on the Arizona Game and Fish Department's website. There's also, um, you know, staff that has access to this. The biologists love these cams, uh, depending on what they're focused on, because they actually use this for research. Um, all of these are obviously geared towards the internet. Our particular internet server that we use that streams these for us is HD on tap. Um, there's many options out there. This is just the one that we use. But you can see the main reason I'm showing this slide is you can see the difference in the level of complexity depending on the camera. So the Peregrine Cam is actually, and we'll see photos of this and talk about it, but it was actually on the Maricopa County uh, administration building. So we had power, we had Wi-Fi. So basically it was a camera, a couple of lights, set it up and we could just plug right in. As opposed to the other end of the spectrum, the Bog Deagle cam, there's the camera, there's the enclosure, there's solar power for the camera it's, and the audio, there's solar power for a repeater station because it had to be beamed to a mountaintop before it could beam to the department. So obviously much more extensive, there's more opportunity for things to go wrong. Um, and then everything in between. So if we break down the considerations, you know, obviously the number one consideration is a prime location. You need observable activity, right? People don't want to tune into a camera to see nothing. They want to see cool stuff. That's what they're, they're tuning in for. So regular observable activity. It can be seasonal, but it should be regular during that season. Um, also, you need access to Wi-Fi or Internet. That can be done line of sight up to a distance of about seven or eight miles, depending on your terrain. Um, you can easily and cheaply beam the signal about seven miles reliably um, to uh, from point to point. Um, but repeater stations themselves, which you need like for the Eagle Cam, it's at Lake Pleasant, which is just northwest of, of the headquarters where I'm seated now. And it's only seven miles as the crow flies. But what is in between us is a mountain. So we had to build a repeater station on top of the mountain that had to be solar powered to basically beam the signal then to the building. So look for low hanging fruit. Do you have a hummingbird feeder by your office? Uh, do you have properties that you manage that deer visit or elk visit or whatever the case may be? L always look for the low hanging fruit. Some place that has a visitor center that has Wi-Fi that has power. Those are obviously the low hanging fruit that you should be looking for. And this will allow you, to, you know, your uh, your service provider to simulcast uh, your uh, your stream. Will you allow that? So if you broadcast yourself to YouTube, which is an option that you can do, you don't have to worry about this. But if you have a service provider like we do, we have HD on tap. Do you allow them to broadcast on their page as well? Most of the time, the answer will be yes because there's a deal to be had. So they make money by charging ad revenue for people to advertise on their site. So this is an important point. They can make significant ad revenue money. So that should cut your cost of streaming service. Uh, our streaming service is literally cut by uh, two thirds because we allow our service provider to stream on their website. And that kind of um, helps uh, take away from the out of pocket cost for, to the program. And will a mobility of equipment become an issue season to season? Are you going to leave that camera up? Are you going to move it from point A to point B? Um, typically, if you're using a service provider, you pay for an annual stream, meaning that in the months that a camera is not active and you're just looking at like blank space or a barn or something, the inside of a barn, you're still paying for that for that feed. So that's something to consider. And how will you push this new stream uh, to drive digital engagement. So that's why that video that I showed before, the kind of you know corny uh, trailer that we made for it, um, that was a uh, 
one of the ways that we promoted that mostly on social uh, media, Instagram and Facebook. And by doing that uh, and showing that video there, it really drove the numbers of viewers to the cam. So if we take a look at each of these, like the bald eagle cam, one of the ways that we supplement the costs uh, and, and defray it a little bit is by having a donation button on the website. So when you're viewing the camera on our website or on our server's website. And this was part of the agreement that we said, you can stream it, but you need to have the donation button. This takes you to a donation link. That money goes directly into our account. And unlike most of our funding, it doesn't go back to general fund at the end of the year because it's a donation fund. So it stays in our coffers, so to speak, and it enables us to do things like every few years, maybe add a new camera. This is called an overlay. We don't have the ability here at Game and Fish to put an overlay. Our service provider did that. And again, all you would have to do is click on that button. It would take you right to our donation page while you're viewing the camera. You increase the size of the camera, that donation button stays there. So just showing you some of the images that we get um, uh, from the cam. So this is the Nest. And obviously the camera is not zoomed in at the moment, but it's 192 feet away from the camera. And this particular case, the eagle landed right there by the camera. Great shot, right? Well, to get that shot requires somebody monitoring the camera, moving the camera, adjusting the camera, and staying within any other parameters you have. For example, this water body of water right here, Lake Pleasant, is actually owned by uh, Bureau of Rec. Bureau of Rec does not really want us showing water um in the in the screen for they have their reasons uh for not wanting that but so we have to be careful we can't leave the camera for example in the off season it would be nice to just show the lake it's pretty nice sunrises and sunsets could advertise fishing and boating but they don't want it so we have to abide by that agreement with the landowner um but monitoring the cam can be time consuming and it must be consistent. Somebody has to check that cam at least a few times a day, uh, unless it's a nest cam where all you're doing is zoomed in and focused on the nest. But most cams require that. You also have to consider the mount. So in this case, this mount was custom built. Do you have that ability in house? So we have a shop here at Arizona Game and Fish Department associated with our shooting range that can build stuff. But in this case, it was made out of aluminum and we didn't have the ability to weld aluminum. So we had our uh, service provider, the, the owner of that company is actually doing the installation here. He made this, this was seven, $800 to have this custom mount made. It's not uber expensive, but it is something to consider. And we'll do a breakdown of costs as we move forward. But you have to consider the expertise to do these kind of things. Is that something you have in-house or are you gonna need a contractor to do that? So we seem to be going the wrong direction. Here we go. Okay, so solar panels. Right now, solar or, or PV, photovoltaic, um, is needed for remote locations. And you know, you can also do some really creative partnerships. So for example, this is actually power uh, solar panel that powers the camera and the audio, but the one on top of the mountain that we installed, you know, either humans are gonna have to hump the gear up a mountain which the batteries alone are about 60 pounds a piece. It takes four of those batteries. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of effort. Well, we got our local, uh, one of the local power companies, Salt River Project, donated a pilot and a helicopter to help bring that equipment to the mountaintop, which was fabulous. Um, saved us a tremendous amount of time and energy in getting that done. We still had about another 400 feet of elevation to gain from the landing site, but it was a lot better than the 2,000 feet of elevation we would have had to gain carrying all that equipment on our back. So this, you know, uh, flexibility to provide uh, uh, does the wildlife locations that are remote, because a lot of times the best viewing is not somewhere that's the low hanging fruit that's right outside your door. So doing these kind of setups sometimes can be necessary. One of the things that I would advise as well, I don't know what the environmental regulations are in your particular state. But in most states, you have to comply with environmental regulations and archaeological surveys and things like that. 
that can be avoided a lot of times by building a sled. And I'll show you pictures of this, building a sled that basically you don't have to disturb the ground. It sits on top of the ground instead of digging posts into the ground, which would require much more extensive, costly and time consuming environmental compliance and archeological surveys. Um, and you know it can be cost effective to do solar. So a solar array like this, including all the electrical equipment, the batteries, the solar panel, the sled, that's about $6,500 to $7,000 for a professional setup like this that's ready to handle all weather. But for example, in one of our cameras, we just installed the Great Horned Owl Cam. We were gonna run cable. It was about a quarter mile run. That would have cost $15,000 just in material um, to run that. So it was actually cheaper to use solar. Depends on your location, whether or not solar may work or how well it will work. The storage box, this is, you know, the batteries, the storage deep cell cycle batteries there that uh, store the energy from the solar cell. Um, and these are 100 amp batteries. I can get into the details. If you have questions, I'll give my email address at the end. Feel free to reach out to me. I can give you all this information. I don't want to spend too much time getting into the technical nitty gritty. But, you know, uh, anytime you're dealing with raptors, doing a, a quick camo job is well worth the time to avoid the um, uh, uh, eye catching ability of just a, a white box out there in the desert. Um, ultimately, we camoed this entire uh, array. This is the array that powers the camera. Um, the solar um, uh, cell protects the box from most sunlight most of the day, which helps keep temperatures down. We'll talk about why that's important as well. And uh, force venting may be needed. So in other words, like computer fans on each side of the box to pull air through it. Here in Arizona, as you might know, it gets pretty warm. The inside of that box uh, can easily exceed 140, 150, 160 degrees. And that's not too good on the electrical components themselves, in particular one component that I'll talk about uh, that can be difficult. Um, it's remote sensor for temperature usually runs between 50 and $100. It's well worth it because you can monitor the internal temperature and tell whether or not that's causing your problems as you monitor your cameras throughout the year. Um, wide angle antenna like this that's circled here in red makes alignment with the repeater station, which is on a mountaintop over uh, off to the top left of this photo. Um, it's about uh, two miles away, but wide angle antennae like this have a, a seven to 10 degree spread. So it's really easy. You don't need to get it within a one degree uh, fine tune with somebody on top of the mountain and somebody here adjusting the antennae. Uh, it's really easy to do. Um, and again, the weighted sleds, you can see the rocks here. This sled is made out of uh, Unistrut. Um, you can buy that at any home improvement store. It's relatively inexpensive, $2.25 to $2.50 a linear foot. And you can bolt it together, load it with rocks, and then that way you don't have problems with this acting as a big wind sail and moving your camera. Um, the camera itself, you can see the camera here, we uh, disguised it with this kind of cairn of rocks and branches and vegetation to uh, add security. So it's not so visible to people, but also to make it less visible to the eagles themselves. We ultimately spray painted the housing as well, uh, did a camo job on that. Here's the nest you can see uh, from the camera, kind of this is um, uh, what it would look like to your naked eye. Um, and this is zoomed in. Uh, we can zoom right in on that. Uh, these cameras have, have about a 30 power zoom. Uh, they're not terribly expensive compared to what they used to cost, but you can see it's an HD cam. You get terrific photos. Here they are, it's uh, in between the, the, the nest and uh, the lake. Um, and you can get all kinds of good images and video from your uh, camera that you can use for promotion, you can use for messaging um, and these are things that people really love. Bald eagles, I gotta say, are hugely popular uh, with people um, easily as much as the peregrine falcons. Uh, very few things are as strong as raptors when it comes to videos, but infrared. So that camera again is 192 feet away. The infrared that's built into the modern cameras, uh, don't mind the date, the date was not set at this point, it is inaccurate. Um, the uh, infrared can shoot out about 620 feet and fully illuminate that nest at night um, without many difficulties at all and give you views of the eagles at night without disturbing the wildlife. They can't see the infrared spectrum. So uh, it also allows for occasional sleuthing 
um, when you get something like a ringtail cat, Basariscus astutus, coming in and eating your eagle eggs at night, um, and which happened a couple of years ago. And we, you know, you, you wake up in the morning, you check the camera, and you see the egg has been destroyed. Well, you go back and look at the footage, and you see how that actually happened. Was this ringtail scaled down the cliff and got into the nest and ate the egg? Um, ravens ate other eggs. Um, but just showing you a little bit, I'm not going to show this whole thing, but, you know, it gives people an intimate look into the daily lives of wildlife. This is what people really want to see. They don't get the opportunity to see this outside of Discovery Channel very much. And if they're in your state, they feel really connected to the fact that this is by this really popular lake. They've named these, these eagles, you know, they're all kinds of sunny and share and all kinds of names that they name these things. And they get really, really into it. But it gives them an opportunity to see what nature is really like, which can be very useful uh, in your messaging. So ultimately, you saw the great views that we had. This is where we uh, take the boat along the lake. We uh, dock the boat here, I'll land the boat here, hike up the mountain. Uh, the Eagle camera itself is in this location on this cliff. Uh, you can see the scale. This bar is 2,000 feet. The camera, uh, the nest itself is in this location, so right near that camera. But nature never uh, is very predictable or reliable and doesn't always play nice with us. They, uh, they use that nest one year. The next year, a new male came in, usurped the old male and he wanted a nest in a different location. So they built the nest across the lake, a quarter mile away from our camera. Uh, uh, viewing is not quite as good anymore. Um, and they have not been successful in that new location. This is the new nest location across the lake in the opposite direction from the old nest. This is the closest we can get. And you can see that's quite quite a powerful zoom. This is zoomed. This is fully zoomed in. This is the nest here, as you can see. But still, the view is nowhere near what it used to be. But there's nothing we can do about that. So this is something you have to consider. Are we going to move the camera? That's an expensive thing to do. Now, thankfully, we keep the repeater station in its current location um, and beam directly to it. So Peregrine Falcon Cam, our biggest hit ever. Um, Without a doubt. Um, so as you can see, this is the Maricopa County Administration Building. This right here is the uh, camera. Um, this is a raptor biologist, just in case you wonder. They all look like this. All raptor biologists uh, look exactly like uh, Alan Zufeld here. I'm joking, obviously. Um, but the camera can uh, pan, tilt, and zoom. So we got great views of the peregrines on the ledges. Uh, this is a zoomed in view of this little portal. Basically, it's made to go out and clean the windows on the building. And they allowed us access to this. And we put the nest box right up to that. This is just the, uh, you know, each build is unique unto itself. And it always takes more time than you anticipate. So anticipate that. Um, and we put together this camera, built the nest box, mounted it all, uh, and then slid it into place. This is a view looking out of the nest box. Um, this is the fully assembled nest box, which obviously you can access if needed uh, the nest in the back. Um, again, power setup is really easy. Basically just run an extension cord there and we had Wi-Fi. The other advantage to a situation like this is one, we're not paying for the Wi-Fi. Maricopa County was picking that up. And two, because it's a county administration building, what ends up happening is they have super high-end Wi-Fi, premium cable service. So plenty of bandwidth for an HD camera and a great customer service if you have an issue. So if these are available to you, that's a great opportunity uh, when you have situations like this. Uh, this is the main view from the camera itself. Unfortunately, as things start to heat up um, globally and here locally in Phoenix, we are now to the point where more than 50% of peregrine falcon nests in downtown Phoenix fail due to temperature. The chicks, um, the uh, uh, young falcons get the, uh, signal due to temperature to leave the nest too early. Uh, they're not fully capable of flight and basically they end up jumping to their deaths um, is more often than not what we encounter now. This nest has been fallow, so to speak, for three years. We're taking the camera and gonna use it, repurpose it elsewhere. Um, it'd be great to have a peregrine falcon nest, but just downtown, it's just not happening. This is a view also from the nest box of the female peregrine coming in. Our bat cam, uh, 
you know, most of the year it looks like this. You're looking at the inside of an old adobe barn. Um, but during a uh, season, we can zoom in. This is, uh, sorry, this is the old camera. We've now upgraded it with an HD camera. Uh, so the view is significantly sharper, but you can zoom in on the bats themselves as they're in there. Um, and this is the setup, this old Adobe barn. You can see all the guano on top of things. The electrical box here that we ran, the camera was set up above this uh, um, ladder here. Here's the camera setup. Um, and, you know, we uh, took all the cabling, uh, screwed it into the joists, used uh, shielding where necessary or conduit because there's rodents in there and they will chew through the wires very quickly. Um, we had uh, the junction box uh, here and here, and we have two infrared lights, one that's lighting each way um, as we put in. It's important to consider in this case, this is a historic barn. It's 70, 80, 90 years old now, wow. Um, and anything over 50 requires special applications, special paperwork, uh, permission from the State Historic Society. So we had to account for every screw and every bolt we put into, uh, the, into the barn. So it's something to consider as the uh, situation that you're in. Again, we're using conduit to protect exposed um, wiring from rodent damage. Um, and in this case, we needed to add venting uh, those fans that are powered, uh, in this case, we have power in the barn, but to vent this to avoid uh, the um, uh, equipment from overheating. Um, and this is the camera. This is an, a central uh, IR cam. Note for, for, to, for compliance, and we talked about this being a historic building, reducing the number of fasteners is important. So we did things like um, mount the camera itself uh, to a board that way we could uh, uh, mount this board with fewer bolts than if we were bolting the camera itself to the beam. Um, this fabulous bat here, just being fabulous. Uh, you can see it's old logo. So this is right when we got it set up. So it's before we did the HD cam, but looking into, I don't know how these things live because they don't apparently sleep. This is during the daytime, but them fidgeting around all day. People love this. They tune in to see these bats up close and watch them chittering and chatting and grooming each other all day long. So pretty cool. Our most reliable cam easily, hands down, our Sandhill Crane cam. This thing as a cult following, it doesn't get as big numbers as Raptor cams, but it is a hugely popular cam and people are aggressive if it goes down for 10 minutes. People are calling and emailing and freaking out um, if this cam goes down. They rely on this camera and they love doing this from their own home. So looking at the setup for this solar panel set up uh, to power the camera, um, PV has come a long way, a photovoltaic has come a long way. It used to take three panels to power a camera, it now takes one panel due to increases in efficiency. Um, again, we used a sled so we didn't have to apply for all the environmental and archeological survey uh, work to be done using the Unistrut, anchoring that to cinder blocks and then loading it with rocks. Again, that super strut is you know, fairly inexpensive, uh, two and a quarter to 250 a, a linear foot. You can see the blocks, the super strut. Um, camera itself is mounted on about an eight foot pole. Uh, this is the camera. This is the uh, um, antenna that sends it out. We even camouflaged it with Russian thistle, which um, I wasn't involved at that point, but I would strongly recommend not using Russian thistle to camouflage anything because if you have to go back and deal with it, you have to deal with the Russian thistle and it's, it's miserable. Um, but the camera, this is a patented housing, which is kind of cool. Uh, it has a basically a window washer. You can see the window washer built right in and you just have to fill this liquid about once a year. This is the blade and it rotates around so it keeps it clean, which is great because we don't have one of these on the back cam. There's a smudge right in the middle of it right now. And it's a three hour drive each way from work uh, for me to go down there and to uh, wipe a smudge off the lens. So. Again, those infrared abilities provide unparalleled views at night. Uh, we recently had a story picked up by uh, multiple news outlets across the country, one in Texas, one in California, about a coyote that came and was like standing on the shore looking at thousands of sandhill cranes that were kind of uh, uh, nest, uh, 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 overnighting in the, in the water, but really interesting stuff. And here, giving you an idea of the distances that you can beam signal, this is a pole barn. Ultimately, that's where our great horned owl cam is. And this is the bunkhouse where the Wi-Fi 
used to be situated. It's no longer situated there. It's now situated actually in the pole barn because the uh, bunkhouse is scheduled for destruction. Um, so we didn't want the Wi-Fi to go down during that period of time. So the Wi-Fi is actually the main signal comes into the pole barn. And then this camera beams to the pole barn. You can see it's still angled uh, when it was set up beaming to the, the bunkhouse. Um, but no problems covering those distances. It allows for close-up individual views, behavioral views. People eat this up. They love seeing this intimate glimpse of wildlife. They really do. Um, and you can see the camera. Uh, sorry, there's no sound on this clip, but you can see that there's sometimes you know really good stuff uh, uh, people get to watch um, during the day. Uh, of these cranes, you can monitor this camera. You want to make sure you stay on cranes at certain times of the year. Uh, for us, it would be December, January, February. It's no problem. There's pretty much cranes there all all the, all day long. But uh, really phenomenal views. Um, and let's for, not forget, some cameras are set up and are very successful off season, just because it's a beautiful site and because other wildlife visits the site. So whitewater draw where a sandhill crane cam is. It draws in lots of people for birds year round, not just when St. Hill Cranes are there. It's a beautiful location. People tune in just to watch the sunset um, frequently. But one of the things I give a warning about is to be cognizant of the audio signal. You may want to turn that off, off season. Uh, during season, people can't walk out near the camera, but off season they can. And if you have audio, it's picking up people and it's picking up what they're saying. And you as a state agency or a federal agency may be broadcasting things that you don't want to be broadcasting that may be inappropriate, depending on the viewing audience. So be cognizant of where you place those uh, mics and how you communicate that information out to people that they may be being recorded. So our great horned owl cam, uh, we had a great first year with this camera. Unfortunately, uh, one of the owls did not show up this year, probably died due to whatever reason, um, but didn't show up. Uh, the um, uh, female, we, we got reports that it was a female, that was a male. Unfortunately, they only showed up at night and under infrared lighting and sometimes difficult to tell the difference when they're alone between the male and the female due to you know the, the coloring, uh, the color markings you know, don't come in clear. Uh, but in this case, this camera was very expensive, but we got, a, a, we, did a partnership in collaboration with the Arizona Sportsman for Wildlife Conservation, which is a hunting group. They wanted to show off their kinder, gentler, friendly side, um, their softer side. So they funded this camera and um, they gave us $20,000, which paid for most of the installation of that camera. And what we do is on the website where you go to see this camera, we have uh, information about who funded it. And this is a live link on the website. So you click on it and it takes you right to the Arizona Sportsman. Uh, web page. Um, and you can make agreements like this to be in perpetuity, a year, two years at a time, but it's just a way to potentially offset the cost of installation of these cameras. If we take a look at this installation, this is again in a pole barn and a zoomed in view of the equipment uh, that we mounted to the rafters inside of this barn. Fairly unobtrusive in this particular case. This is the infrared light, the camera itself, junction box, the microphone, covered with a high density foam, uh, non-porous foam, um, to avoid, uh, to cut down on the wind noise that you get. Uh, so it's important to think about that because you don't want to be listening to wind howl the entire time. Although in this case, you're listening to the loose uh, uh, corrugated steel banging around in the wind anyway. Uh, so this is where the nest is in that barn. The camera for the whitewater draw would be off to this side, way out here on this. A particular uh, location. And one of the things that we did is, you know, route, routing the wires to not be uh, an aesthetic draw, a visual draw, keeping them up tight against the rafters is important. One for, so it doesn't get snagged. So uh, less available to rodents and other uh, critters. And just to keep the aesthetic appeal uh, in this case, it's a pole barn. So it's not really important, but taking a look at that equipment, the electronic components, uh, are in this box mounted on the inside. On the other side of this board is the uh, photovoltaic array, which we'll show you. This is an owl, or owl box. Notice the conduit. We used metal conduit uh, when it was close to the ground to avoid rodent damage. This is the inside of the box. It's a bunch of 
mumbo jumbo and spaghetti that I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. The one thing I want to point out is, are these two devices here. They're called PoE injectors or power over ethernet injectors. If you live in a state that gets high temperatures here, Florida, Texas, places down south, this is a concern because this is the part that is going to fail due to temperature more than anything other. Nobody really makes one that has a super high heat tolerance yet. The highest ones I could find, actually our, our expert could find, it's not like I went searching for them, was 148 degrees Fahrenheit inside of a metal box that gets sun exposure. Now this one is in the barn, so it doesn't, but if it gets direct exposure to sun, 148 degrees is no problem to achieve. And what happens is these usually burn out on an annual basis and you have to go down there and replace them. Thankfully, even for somebody who's electronic, uh, electrically limited in their capacity, like me, can do this. It's basically two screws and some plugs and they're about a hundred to $150 a piece. So not terribly expensive, but bear that in mind that this is a cost that you probably will have to uh, uh, update at least every one, two or three years. This is the uh, uh, photovoltaic system mounted to the other side. That electrical box is right here on the inside of this barn. Note one panel handled it all. Um, and it allowed us to go off grid and not spend $15,000 just in copper cable to run it to this location. The antennae uh, that are used to broadcast Wi-Fi, again, we centered the Wi-Fi here now, um, and this is broadcasting that signal out to the bunkhouse because there's an office in there for the area property manager, and this one is broadcasting to the camera itself and to the uh, crane cam, so the, everything goes through this one central location. First year, again, it was fabulous. We got good uh, great horned owls on camera. Um, this is actually the year before that of uh, three outlets. Um, we had two the first year that the camera was there. Great opportunities for uh, viewing of these uh, beautiful creatures. Again, desert pupfish. Um, it's like visiting another world. It's good to put it on in the background and it will lull you to sleep. This does have a loyal following of a few hundred people per month that come to, to view this camera. Good thing is, is that it's on a community college campus and they basically handle the Wi-Fi costs and the power costs. So this is what our main page looks like. On each uh, camera, there's a link to the camera and a link to background information. People want this, they need this. Uh, it tells them about the critter uh, or critters that they're gonna see and it tells them about the back history of the camera. For each camera, we have that going on. And this is just a, I'm not going to read this, but this is just the kind of information about the pupfish cam, uh, tells who the partner is, and it gives you some information about the critters, why they're important, things like that. So how much does all of this cost? It's what everyone wants to know, right? This can be done for a few hundred dollars if you get a webcam yourself and you have the technical ability to be able to get this and publish that broadcast on a YouTube channel, literally a few hundred bucks and you can get this done yourself. If you want big professional arrays like this that are streamed through a service, so if there's a problem, basically that can be diagnosed remotely, all of that, it's a much more expensive endeavor. So let's take a look at one of those cases. Most recently, we did the Great Horned Owl Cam, so we can see um, here uh, that it was uh, not a cheap uh, endeavor. So the camera itself, about 1,800 bucks. The solar array, about 6,500 bucks. I'm not gonna talk about each item, but the, the system and array, uh, the solar array and temperature probes is basically what that is telling you. Um, all of this ended up, and if we look POE, POE injector, in this case it was 172, that's come down to about $115. Uh, the, the radios, the amps, the fuses, everything that is including, don't forget, travel time uh, per diem, uh, cost in fuel per gallon uh, for your service provider or for your staff uh, as you're going. The support from our server, that's about $1,200 per camera per year. That's what we're paying for that level of support. This includes fixing any problems, resetting. They can do most of this stuff remotely. That would be about $4,000 if we didn't allow them to stream it on their website. So again, something to pay attention to. Very uh, expensive, cost us about nine grand to have this installation done by professionals. Uh, our IT department cannot support this. 
you may have a different situation where your IT department has the technical expertise and or the time to be able to support it. We don't, so we had to farm this out. So, so the total cost for this was just over $21,000 for this camera. The donation button has helped. Again, we got a $20,000 grant. Obviously, that cut the cost way down for us. And uh, out of pocket was about $1,000. We have more than made that up in donations, but we definitely would not have made $21,000 so far in donations, especially with this year being largely, uh, you know, you're just looking at empty desk. So you have the wildlife cam. You can either go through a service provider or an in house system set up. You can stream to your own YouTube channel. That's fairly simple to do. Um, but you need somebody to monitor that. And uh, the advantage to doing that or using a service provider, I can tell you what draws eyes, what gets eyeballs on your camera is not just good wildlife and good views, it's the biologists. What the public really want are access to a biologist on a timely basis. It could be once a month, but 30 minutes with a biologist so they can ask their questions and get answers to their questions is immensely valuable. You can use service providers like we use HD on Tap, which is a small private company. There are much bigger companies out there, uh, organizations like explore.org, which is run by uh, Charlie Annenberg. If they pick up your camera and just will stream it, they'll actually pay the streaming costs and the uh, potentially the Wi-Fi costs for you as well. Um, they draw millions of eyes. What they find, and uh, I'm good friends with the um, uh, field uh, director of operations for explore.org, uh, he used to be at HD on tap. And one of the things that you find is, again, what drives views is content, not just the wildlife content, but having daily or weekly updates from the biologist. Hey, this is what you're looking at. This is what's going on this season. This is, and that really makes a big difference. Or you can go the inexpensive route in-house and doing it yourself. It still gives you access to like YouTube, you, where the biologist can give updates. The public really craves that. So at this point, this is my email address. Um, and I'm gonna ask what questions you may have that I hopefully can answer. Um, if questions come up, in the future, I don't care if it's an hour from now or a year from now, if you have questions about how certain things are done, I'll do my best to answer them. Feel free to email me or call me at any point in time. Um, and uh, it may take me a few days sometimes to get back to you, but I will get back to you. All right, thanks so much, Jeff. I know we have one question from Virginia and Sergio, I don't know if you're still on or want to unmute yourself. Sure, yeah, thanks, Jeff. This was a very informative um, presentation. So I just wanted to mention, and, and my colleague Megan Thomas is also on the call, yeah. uh, that we also use HD on tap as our service provider for yes. our Falcon Cam in Richmond. And we have opted uh, to stream exclusively via our website so that HD on tap is not streaming on their website. Yep. And we may be paying more for this, but the positive trade off for us is that we that all eyeballs, anybody that's viewing the camera is viewing it through our website. And then we can also control the interpretive messaging, as you mentioned, you know, by a regular blog post. So I, I was just wondering what drove your decision to allow HD on tap to stream on their website, if you had any concerns about their potentially drawing viewers away from them, as well as potentially losing control of the narrative, because I know they have a chat feature where you know, if it's not monitored, people post all kinds of stuff on there. Yes, uh, excellent question. So initially, and we're, we may be very well transitioning away from the current situation where we are allowing them to stream. Um, my uh, annual budget is uh, about an eighth of a bucket of lukewarm water. Um, and uh, originally the decision was made purely financially. So is it worth paying, you know, three times as much to, uh, and, and that's what our quote was at the time, um, to pay three times as much or even twice as much to allow them to stream on their webs, uh, to not, you know, to have it exclusive to us. Originally the decision was made uh, before my time to allow them to stream. Um, 
we may be moving away from that. One of the things that we're investigating this year, we're still contracted. We just re-upped our contract with HD on tap. And Tim is great to work with in many regards. Tim is the uh, the, the owner there at HD on tap. He's a very smart guy. He problem solves like nobody's business. Um, sometimes I find it difficult as non-technical person. Uh, you know, I'm a biologist, not a, a techie, right? And so getting him to speak in lay terms that I can actually understand may be difficult sometimes. Um, but uh, we're going to be transitioning some of our cameras to our YouTube channel because one of the directives by our e-staff is to drive eyeballs to our YouTube channel for that content and get more eyeballs on that. We did do an analysis about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now, on how many uh, viewers were going to HD's site versus our site. Um, and surprise, I was completely shocked, to be honest with you. Surprisingly, about 80 to 85% of viewers were still viewing it on our website, not on HD on TAP's website. But you are absolutely correct about the narrative on uh, HD on TAP has the forum where you can, you know, a thread where you can comment. And that is a, a critical. And one of the things that we've never really done is control that narrative like you're talking about. So we don't log in and monitor the chat. We don't give weekly updates to the chat. Good things about doing a YouTube or like explore.org if you can get them interested in your camera. Um, and I'll be happy to share contacts with that with you as well if you're interested. But um, are that they allow a feature where there's an update that stays at the top right under the camera uh, until you update it again. For us, we have to update the website and I don't have access to our website. We have one webmaster for the entire website for the entire game and fish department. So if I need to put an update, I have to contact Jeanette is her name and say, hey, Jeanette, can you work this in? Can you take this out and put this update in? And it's a hassle uh, for us, for her. So, uh, being able to control that narrative is is really useful. Uh, do you do that on your website where you stream these? Do you have a thread where people can comment? Uh, we do not. We just post. Uh, we have a blog that we post right underneath the camera. Yeah. Just on, you know, as particular events happen or just on a semi-regular basis. So. Right. Understood. And that's what we try to do, too. Um, doing little videos live with the biologist, uh, you know, the most popular camera on explore.org are the brownies, the brown bears, brown bear at uh, up on the Katmai. And um, one of the reasons it's so popular is because one brown bear, it's just charismatic, cool, cute, you know, sharp teeth, all the things that people like. Um, but also because the biologists that monitor those cameras are on camera all the time. They, uh, you can set it up and you can do this with your own YouTube channel too, where you can actually film using your phone um, and do five minute lives, you know, visiting the camera, the camera site uh, uh, or just a live with the biologists and doing that once a month or once a week or whatever you have time to do really drives hits. Um, it, people really want that ability to talk to a biologist and ask questions just be forewarned, as I'm sure, you know, those questions will go far, far afield from whatever it is you have on camera. We have a few more questions, um, that have come in. We have about five or six questions. So sure. I'm going to do a few rapid fire. I think are special permits needed for filming bald eagle nests. No. Uh, no permit is needed for filming the bald eagle nest. No. Who did you get your grant through? You said the twenty thousand dollar offset. That was that sport fisherman or sport sportsman group. group, right? Yeah, it was Arizona Sportsman for Wildlife Conservation. So a lot of times, sportsman's group in your individual state um, may be very interested in sponsoring a cam like this and getting their name out there for for doing uh, things that help wildlife conservation and help educate people. And then, um, and I would say on the sponsorship angle, just make sure that you're clear about what kind of recognition and um, real estate you can offer them because that's what they wanna know. They wanna know how you're gonna get their name out and the good stuff they're doing by supporting that camp. So think through what real estate you have to offer. He showed on his website, there may be other ways you can offer real estate in Facebook posts or Twitter posts or things like that. And what the um, term, the time term of that too is important. Right, uh, it's not in perpetuity, it's for three right. years or one year or whatever. 
Absolutely. Someone said, what is the additional annual cost following installation? So you gave the full installation, but how long does an external camera and setup typically last? So how long does that initial install last? And then what's the yearly maintenance cost? So the installation itself can easily last 10 years. If you're using like, that's one of the advantages of using this professional grade high-end stuff is that it will last a long time. The P, the photovoltaic array will last about 10 years. The batteries uh, typically will last five or six. You'll have to replace the batteries about every five or six years if you're using PV. Um, the annual costs are if you're paying for streaming. So in our case, it's about $1,200 a camera for the streaming. And if you have to pay for Wi-Fi. So frequently in remote locations, we have to upgrade the Wi-Fi for that location to be able to handle a 24 hour a day, high definition stream. Uh, that can run $300 a month. It depends on your uh, cable structure where you are. And then this question, um, are you hiring biologists and then training them to handle the installation and setup? Or are you hiring electrical electronic technicians and having them work with biologists? Which direction do you go? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, so right now, when we eventually get another position, there's two of us for the state of Arizona, we are fighting to get another position. One of the things that we would look for, it wouldn't be necessarily a requirement, but it would be a big bonus is if somebody had these kind of technical skills on, on board, that would be very useful. But no, uh, generally speaking, we focus on biologists and we get uh, people that are interested um, uh, either we're paying for that or occasionally we can use our in-house, you know, IT people. But to be honest, it's rare that we can do that. We usually have to pay a contractor. Right. Uh, Megan and Virginia, do you have any numbers on how many people view crane cam at night? And there's a follow-up because she's currently working on installation of a similar cam and debating whether or not to include infrared into the build to allow for night views of waterfowl? I, I don't off the top of my head. However, I, one of the advantages to using um, uh, a service provider like HG on tap is every single week and then once a month we get stats. Those stats tell us how many people are viewing the camera, a total number and unique IPs. Um, it tells us what percentage each camera is getting. It tells us where those people are viewing from. So what states in the US and what countries? We get viewers from 40 states and more than 40 countries around the world viewing our cameras. It tells us the time of day, the duration of their visit, how long they're staying on that camera, the dwell time, so to speak. And all of that information is available. And uh, so that is important data for things like the crane cam, and the Eagle Cam when it was close. Right now it's too far away, the IR can't illuminate it. But for the Crane Cam, our nighttime viewership is about a third of the daytime viewership. So many hundreds of people every single night viewing the camera. All right, are there any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat. And you have Jeff's contact info if any pop up into your head later. I do have a quick question. Um, hi, this is Lori from Minnesota. And I hi, just, Lori. I couldn't type fast enough. So you said that you get all of these stats and all of this data from all of the different cameras. Where, yes. where does that come from? How do you get that all compiled? I mean, how did you say so from IP addresses? Uh, so yes, yeah, so that information comes in and our service provider, in this case, HD on tap, gets all that information and they uh, give it to us. They don't give us the actual IP address. It just tells us the what they call unique uh, client IP. And that just means an individual. So if Cheyenne, my, my partner in crime was at her desk, uh, she would have a different IP address than I would have. Um, and so it tells you how many people are coming to your camera. Um, this information is typically available even on YouTube. If you have a YouTube channel with the department that you work for, the, uh, most of the time your IT folks or your uh, web, uh, um, webmaster has access to the analytics that they get this information. And uh, depending on what server you're using um, uh, or what platform you're using, you get different levels of analysis and uh, data from that. But ours are 
pretty extensive. HD Untapped does a, 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 a darn good job at getting us that. Sometimes it goes down this week, for instance, we didn't get our report on Monday morning like we normally do. Uh, so we had to reach out to them and we're probably gonna get the data two weeks late um, until they get that sorted out. But all of that information is provided by our service provider, which is another reason. Sometimes it's cheaper to do things yourself, but sometimes it's worth the money. So if something goes down, instead of me trying to get time on our IT department's schedule to get something fixed, we can just call HD and say, hey, we need this fixed. And we're paying them under contract. So they, they get right on it and they fix it for us. Right. That's great. Yeah. We do it all ourselves now, but as we add more cameras, we'll be considering a, a service provider. So that's great to know. Right. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Of course. All right. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you, Jeff, for sharing all this information and all of these good stats and numbers. I think that's always the helpful part. We know this could be really good, but seeing how much it costs and being able to start planning in our heads who you could partner with and who has Wi-Fi and all of that is is really helpful piece of the puzzle. So thank you. And um, we, put in the, we put in the chat how to sign up for future webinars if you didn't get this webinar invite directly. And we are going to be doing them once a month uh, coming up. So thank you. And we'll, with that, I'll stop recording. Thank you, everyone.